okay. <laughs> All right, so let's start. Where are we? Tēnā koutou. Welcome, everyone. My name's Asher Anderson, and I'm one of the Executive Committee for the People's Inquiry 2020, and I'm also a trustee of Flora and Fauna of Aotearoa, and I'll be helping to facilitate this session on behalf of our committee. I'm joining you all today from the far north of Aotearoa. Um, last month, our committee took part in the Social Movements and Social Change Conference, where we presented this discussion. There were, however, some time constraints and limited spaces for people to attend, so we decided to hold the discussion again to make it available to a wider audience and to expand in a few areas. Uh, and this, of course, is International Human Rights and Animal Rights Day, so um, thank you for joining us. And um, I'd just like to let you know this session's being recorded so that we can share it later. And um, we ask all of our guests if you could please keep your microphones on mute and your cameras off, so it's just our um, panel discussion. Um, and we will have time for Q&A afterwards. So uh, if you have questions, do take notes or just pop them in the chat. You can see the chat function there in the menu. All right, so let's start with a little bit about this inquiry. Uh, the People's Inquiry 2020 is a citizen-led inquiry into the impacts and effects of toxic chemicals and poisons on our people, wildlife and environment. The purpose of the inquiry is to give voice to those who have been harmed by toxic chemicals. Um, and to acknowledge their experiences um, in a respectful forum. We're accepting submissions in three key areas, experiences of harm, expert knowledge, and non-toxic solutions. And a hearing's planned for early 2021, when submitters can also give oral testimony in person to a panel of independent commissioners. Uh, this inquiry was preceded by the People's Inquiry of 2006 into the aerial spraying campaign carried out over suburbs of Auckland to kill the painted apple moth. You can find out more information about this new inquiry on our website, including the terms of reference, links to interviews, press releases, and other resources. And that's at www.peoplesinquiry2020.nz. I'd like to take a minute to introduce um, each of our speakers who are all on our committee. Um, and I'd also like to give apologies for Hirohunapo O'Callaghan, who was unable to um, join us this evening, even though she was hoping to. Um, Hi there, Carlos, welcome. I'm just going to um, turn your camera off. And um, we're just going to start by introducing uh, Stephanie McKee. Environmental campaigning is in Steph's DNA, dating back to the campaigns against nuclear power and nuclear warships in New Zealand. In the 1970s, she worked with the Friends of the Earth campaign against Aerial 245T herbicide and was a co-organizer of the People's Inquiry 2006. With an academic background in psychology, literature, and education technology, she believes in the power of scientific evidence combined with human rights ethics and community values for environmental progress. Stephanie lives in a solar eco village in the northeast Coromandel. Welcome, Steph. Dr. Ursula Edgington. Ursula is a highly qualified and experienced tertiary teacher, a published academic author with a PhD in education. She moved to New Zealand seven years ago and was appalled to discover the widespread and irresponsible use of lethal poisons here. She donates much of her time to raising awareness of the risks from poisons and researching the flaws in law and policy that fail to protect public health. She's a founding trustee of Ecocide Awareness NZ and Ursula lives in the Waikato. Welcome Ursula. Thanks Asha. Hannah Blackmore. Hannah is a community researcher and advocate and has worked in health and welfare field for, on a voluntary basis for nearly 40 years. She's been directly involved since 1996 in documenting and reporting on the adverse effects of urban aerial spraying programs in New Zealand. And she was the convener of the First People's Inquiry in 2006 into one of those campaigns. She's the found, a founder member of the Weed Management Advisory, which is currently focused on opposing the use of toxic chemicals like glyphosate in public places and Hannah lives on Waiheke Island. Welcome, Hannah. Thank you. Okay, so Hira, as I mentioned, Hira Hunapo Callahan is unable to join us this evening. Um, she sends her apologies. She's uh, prepared a short um, audio that we will share afterwards, um, sharing her perspective. Um, so Hira is of Ngāti Wai Whakapapa. She was instrumental in the successful campaign to protect Aotea Great White Barrier Island from marine dumping and she's worked in an advisory role to Iwi with several community groups and organizations. She was mentored and worked alongside the late Del Wihongi, who was involved with the Y262 claim 
and uncle Percy Tippany of Ngāti Hene. Hira has studied the Hazardous Substances and New Organisms Act and monitored hazardous substances and GE consents approved by the EPA over the years. She brings with her a deep connection to Papatuanuku and Mataranga Māori. She lives in Auckland City. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Let's get started. Our discussion is going to centre around the impacts of toxic chemicals in Aotearoa. We're approaching it in roughly three parts. The past, historical cases of harm and the movements to address them. The present, where are we now and have we learned anything? And the future, where are we going from here? We hope you find this discussion informative and thought provoking. We've put together a resource document as well with references to some of the things that are mentioned and that will be available on our website. So um, we'd first like to welcome Hedda. So I'll, I will play the um, video that she's recorded for us, uh, sharing her thoughts and perspectives on the impacts of toxic chemicals on Te Ao Māori, the Māori world, and the context of the Treaty of Waitangi and the ongoing human rights violations. Um, so let me just bring that up for you. Te mea tuatahi hei honore, hei kororia ki a tātou matua nui te rangi, nana nei ngā mea katoa. E i o matua, mana ki te amātou mai te rangi ki te whenua, mai te whenua ki te rangi, haumie, huie, tāakie. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko hira tōku ingoa, no ngāti hene, me ngāti wai ngāpuhi, a hau ke te taho tōku māma. No Ngāti Raukawa, me te arawa a hau ke te taha o tōku pāpa. I tipu ake a hau ki te hakarongo ki ngā kuia me ngā koro. Greetings first and foremost above all else I acknowledge Io Matua, our supreme parent and creator of all creation and living beings. We are begat of the universal elements of the cosmos, and earth as, and as, as much a part of the natural world that surrounds us as it is as much a part of us. We are related through whakapapa genealogy, beautifully and wonderfully gifted into form by Io Matua Kore, our supreme parent and creator, who beget the universe and all that exists. Nā te kore, te pō nui, te pō rua, te pō uriri, te pō kere kere, te pō tifa tifa, te pō tango tango, ki te whei ao, ki te ao mārama, ti hei mauri ora. Conceived from te kore and of the great void and potentiality through the many stages and passages of darkness, chaos, changes and growth before transitioning into the realm of te ao mārama the realm of light and understanding. We are begat of the divine perfect duality of the cosmos, that of the mare, kura, the female element, and the whakukura, the male element, that of Papatua, Nuku, Mother Earth, and Anginui, Father Sky, the cosmos, to that of our matua, tipuna, our tupuna, our ancestors, our grandparents, our kuia, and our koro, through to our parents our mother and father. That perfect duality continues to exist within each and every one of us. And that is why our vital organs are dual, each of both wahine, female, and tāne, male. Every element and mineral within our being can be found within the cosmos and upon, and within the earth and waters. Each has a significant name and purpose to complement and sustain the other. Every part of nature is sacred and interconnected. We are as much a part of our natural world as it is of us. Hence, we must have revered respect for our natural world. Ko mātou he iwi wairua i heke mai i o mātua, nā ko mātou he iwi kaitiaki o ngā taonga tūiho mai i o. We are a spiritual people descended from i o. So our duty is as kaitiaki is the guardian and protector and preserver of those natural taonga 
that have been handed out through eon generations. Aotearoa is a very special place with native Tonga. Each has a significant purpose and are unique to Aotearoa alone. As Tangata Whenua and Kaitiaki, we have an inherent obligation and responsibility to protect and preserve all these Tonga Tuiho, my Iomatua. We never harm or destroy nature in any way. Chemical poisons have absolutely no place within nature or our lives. Yet fatally toxic chemicals, some banned in other countries, have and continue to be approved by the EPA, previously known as IRMA, the Environmental Risk Management Authority, now rebranded EPA, the Environmental Protection Authority here causing very serious health issues and deaths for humans, wildlife and our natural environment. The EPA has breached every clause within the Has No Act and its committee responsible for assessing and approving the use of poisons and consents continue to ignore the wisdom of Matauranga Māori and how their negligent decisions will impact on our natural environment, wildlife, people and other life forms. The, the EPA have yet to be made directly answerable and accountable for their track record of sheer negligence and harm to our environment. The Department of Conservation, Regional Councils and MPI have failed to both acknowledge and admit to the widespread impact on our environment. The Ministry of Health has failed in its fundamental duty of care in protecting and ensuring the health and well-being of people. All these government ministries and entities have directly breached the Treaty of Waitangi, the Human Rights Act and New Zealand Health and Safety Acts along with others. As Kaitiaki we have a duty to make these people directly answerable and accountable for their negligence and we must stop the use of poisons and together work towards alternative solutions towards pest and weed management in, here in Aotearoa towards a poison-free Aotearoa. A mihi, ngā mihi, ngā mihi. All right, thank you very much to Hira for her um, connecting us, really, because um, it goes all the way back to Whakapapa. And I've, we've had discussions with Hira where she really brings it home. It's the pollution of our Whakapapa, of our, of our ge genealogy, you know. So it was a really good starting point. Um, and now I'd like to pass it over to Steph, who's going to take us through some of the more practical aspects, some of the, um, the tangible you know, historical occurrences that have happened in this country. Um, a little look at the past. Stephanie, over to you. Kia ora everyone. Um, every time I hear Hida speak, she really um, just makes us think even more deeply about this whole issue. And what our people's inquiry is focused on is, is about the poisoning of our country um, but we want to change it but how do we change it because it it goes so deep um, what hit me this time with Hera's message is she talked about the fundamental interconnectedness of people and nature and so I've got a, a short presentation for you and it's probably things that you may know already I imagine but it's a kind of a reminder of our history to do with poisons and it connects to, uh, it relates to colonialism, which is a sort of fundamental disconnect of people and nature. 
And under colonialism, Aotearoa has been stripped, poked and burnt. Stripped for the forests, poked for gold and burnt for pastoral farming. So this was the mentality of the colonial um, imposition on, on these lands. So I, I believe that there's a mindset there that is very deep and that we must change to move away from poisons. So I'll, um, I'll give you this short presentation and um, it's just to remind us where we've come from and um, my fellow friends here will lead us forward as to where we want to go. So um, I'll do a screen share here, see if it works. Um, hmm. Let's see. Um, try again. Can you see that? Not yet. Ah, yes, here we go. Technology. So. Yay. Yay? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Can everyone see that? So this is just a, a short little movie and it's it just going to make us aware that, you know, the patterns get repeated over and over and we're trying to break this pattern. So toxic legacies. So we go back just a few little snippets. I mean, I didn't know that that Kia were considered a pest because they um, attacked sheep. So they, you know, were poisoned and trapped and right up till 1970. So it was only in the last few decades they were given protected status. A huge amount of poisoning also across the ditch in Australia. So this is just touching on, you know, the destruction using poisons to prepare the way for colonial uh, pastoral farming. Then we go to the 1930s where the farming got established and um, in New Zealand there are 50,000 sheep dip sites which are contaminated as a legacy. Um, our own land, we, we have uh, an old sheep dip, we've tested the soil. So there's arsenic contamination all over the place. Um, fast forward, and then you, you know, you've got the DDT, development of DDT. Um, many of these chemicals were developed uh, during wartime to protect the soldiers from mosquitoes, but once the war is over, they have to look for new markets. And you may have seen some horrific old advertisements of housewives, you know, spraying DDT in their cupboards. And um, so this became a horrific problem. And of course, we have our wonderful hero, uh, Rachel Carson, and she, she blew, blew it open, um, exposing the evidence of the bioaccumulation of DDT. Um, and of course, she faced um, attempts to silence her. And this is what happens when you, you blow the lid on some of these things. Um, New Zealand took an, another 20 years pretty well after, or 17 years, um, after America banned DDT till we banned it. And again, once the DDT was detected in meat, then, you know, action was taken. So then we come into another chapter and a very unpleasant one indeed, which is the, the Vietnam War and the Dow Chemical Company producing napalm <coughs> and Ag Agent Orange. Um, and hideous impacts on Vietnam. But again, after the war, there's all this, um, these stocks of chemicals, so they have to find a new market. And um, gorse on New Zealand farms became the enemy. And I, I recall going to a meeting when they knew the writing was on the wall um, because uh, 245T has a very, very nasty um, residual chemical in it called dioxin. Um, when they knew that it might be banned, 
I, I remember Dow came out and had meetings with farmers to to sort of rev them up and say, you, you've got to hang on to this and the economy will collapse. And I went to one of those meetings, um, left a very strong impression on me and taught me how, you know, basically how amoral these um, large chemical companies are. And um, the, the legacy of um, Agent Orange hasn't stopped. You know, anyone who's been to Vietnam will know. But this is a picture of a friend of ours, Graham Sturgeon, who lives in Coromandel. Saw him the other day and I, I checked. He, he wants this picture of himself shown. You know, this is what happened to him as a soldier in Vietnam and he's still suffering. I mean, so this is the 245T. Eventually it did get, well, I think it got banned. I, I've been hearing that it's still being used. So yeah. I have still to check up on that. Then we come into another story, which is uh, Hannah and I were working together and many other people when uh, West Auckland uh, was sprayed with a pesticide containing a bacteria, but they didn't let us know the other ingredients, which um, was found out uh, because they were a bit, um, a bit slow off the mark and, and forgot to delete the page numbers of the, <laughs> of the pharmaceutical book. So there was some other nasty things in the spray, um, methylparaben and, and sodium benzoate, which should never be inhaled. So that this, the people in Auckland were subject to this for two years. And um, so the People's Inquiry gathered evidence and had um, some very um, wonderful commissioners who produced a report showing the human rights and the all the impacts, but again, we we were just dismissed, um, really. However, they've never sprayed again over a city, so we like to think that perhaps we had some impact. <clears throat> so, you know, this rather depressing look at our history, um, you know, and you look at the big picture, there's just so many different chemicals, and, and of course, what, what disturbs us all is that this is continuing. Um, there's constant new registrations of new chemicals. This brodificum is a nasty one that's used in pest control a lot. And um, only two years ago, um, I don't know if it was the Ministry for the Environment went around and they collected tons of DDT, this lying in farmers' sheds. Um, this is our legacy, you know, the poison legacy. And, and today, you know, doing this little journey is, you know, it's, it's quite, it could be quite depressing, but I, I don't know why I'm, I'm just a, an optimist. I feel that we are going to move out of this, this mindset. I really do. And with the help of everyone on board, but um, it seems like in every area, urban and rural weed control, conservation, horticulture, agriculture, the wood industry. Well, it's just a cocktail of poisons. It, it's quite um, worrying. And I always felt that the predator-free program, it had a lot of military language. It, it seems, and it, you know, it was focused initially on extermination, although I think they're sort of modifying it a bit. But um, to me, it, this links back to colonialism, the mentality of extermination. And that picture is a recent event in Coromandel Town. Um, and you'll see a sign there saying Poison Free Coromandel, which I was pleased to see on the front page of our local paper. And this is the Kennedy Bay people. They are protesting a possible 1080 drop over their ancestral land. and. Uh, so um, on to, you know, if you thought that all was depressing, well, how about this? You know, this is the worst thing of all. Well, the firefighting foams is absolutely a shocker. Um, 
only two years ago was the Ministry for the Environment report. And these chemicals, per and polyfluoroalkyl, alkyl, um, they are worse than DDT in terms of not breaking down. And they've been detected in um, groundwaters. And there's a lack of data on the, you know, if they're accumulating in fish and birds. But what's, what's shocking is that the Defence Department knew about this three years before the public. And so this is the, you know, the, again, very unethical, um, you know, these are, as, as Heather said, these government bodies need to be held to account. Um, they knew this has been known for four years already about the impacts of these chemicals on um, health, hormonal development, thyroid, and more. So um, that's not very nice to think about. And so um, in my journey opposing poisons for many years, and um, you probably know about the, the big Monsanto cases recently. Um, again, the tobacco industry, you know, how these big, big companies try to uh, sow the seeds of doubt. And so I call this corporate resistance strategies. And uh, Rachel Carson wrote about it back in the 60s. So it's nothing new. But of course, they've refined these techniques with the help of social media and um, technology and, and the internet now. So uh, somehow all these D words came up. I'm a bit of a poet, so I guess I like alliteration. So that, you know, they discredit those who question or challenge, deny any significant harm, create doubt, disengage and refuse to respond. And we've found this a lot on the Coromandel. Um, so many emails aren't replied to. And um, public relations budget, you know, the damage control. So um, I'm just about wrapped up here, but I call it the poison industrial complex. It's like the military industrial complex. There are all these organizations, both government and private, who uh, collaborate, who have common interests to keep the poison um, regime going because they profit or their careers are at stake, whatever. There's just a great network of organizations that work together. So I call it pseudo kaitiaputanga. You know, Māori words are being appropriated and used, and as, as Heather said, in all these government departments, they are meant to be um, following the tiriti or waitangi, and they use all these beautiful words um, from the Māori tikanga, but it's not, for me, it's, it's false. It's not real caring for the earth. And from looking back at this rather depressing story of history, but inevitably the harmful effects on people and the environment, they come out over time, every time. So we want to change the People's Inquiry and tens of thousands of New Zealanders want to change this paradigm. And here's an example, our local, we, we sent this letter to all members of parliament back in 2017. Uh, when Doc was going to drop 1080 over the sacred mountain, Femoingaho Otama Te Kapua, at the northern end of the Coromandel. And um, these are all signatures of Maori, Pākehā, iwi, scientists. We got hardly one response. It was incredible. So we call this the brick wall of non-response. And so I, um, there's lots of examples. There's a growing international movement for poison-free, pesticide-free towns. It's quite inspiring what's happening actually in Europe and in America. And um, I'm trying to push this line on the Coromandel that they've got this lovely tourist slogan, 
coromandel good for your soul? Well, I reckon a poison-free coromandel is, is also good for your health. And it's good for the economy if, if you have to bring that in for ecotourism. Um, you know, I just think we can, we can make this shift. And, um, ah, oh, it's time. Shift the paradigm. So that's my latest rap song. Um, could add a few beats. And there we go. That's my little presentation for you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steph. Excellent. Thank you very much, Steph. Um, I'm just going to hand over to Hannah, who was going to um, pick up on um, from the 1990s onwards and some of the work that she um, was doing in Auckland City and, uh, and the People's Inquiry that happened there. Yeah. Thank you, Steph. Exactly. So picking up from Steph, um, the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s were very interesting times. Uh, it saw the first strong organized movements against the use of toxic chemicals, which were being sprayed not just on farms and orchards, but in towns and cities. Uh, 1985 saw the inaugural meeting on Auckland's North Shore TAG, the Toxins Action Group, uh, whose objective was the elimination of the use of harmful toxins in New Zealand. That they still exist and that they're still active tells you about the problems that have been ongoing. So at this point, there was unprecedented and increasing action and pressure in Auckland and North Shore cities, opposing herbicide use on the streets and parks, um, with the first moratoriums actually in place in 1988. So by 2000, half of Auckland's population was enjoying non-chemical roadside treatment. But I'm getting ahead of myself because I knew nothing about this, nothing about New Zealand's history of chemical addiction. Uh, immigrating from England, our family arrived in Auckland in 1994. I do remember being unnerved by pesticide adverts on TV, upside down helicopters spraying thistles. Um, I was brought up on what would now be called um, organic farms. Dad didn't even use artificial fertilizers. So New Zealand was a bit of an eye opener. But something happened in 1996 that shocked me to the core and put me onto the path I'm still on today. The government decided to aerially spray pesticide over Auckland's eastern suburbs where I lived to eradicate an alien moth. The success of that campaign emboldened them to use the same technique against other moths. So actually between 1996 and 2004, there were three biosecurity aerial spraying programs that were conducted over heavily populated urban areas of New Zealand on a scale unprecedented worldwide. Who knows about this? Who knows about the extent of the impacts and effects of that spraying? I do because I have been documenting it with the help of many persistent and dogged women. And yes, with some really honorable exceptions, it is women who do this work. But although hundreds of thousands of people were exposed to the pesticide, in some cases over 70 times during nearly two and a half years of aerial spraying, the health consequences of these campaigns have received scant public attention. So why? The evidence from my research and investigations has led me to conclude that not only was there an abdication of responsibility on the part of public health and the government, but ultimately a cover up. Most of the adverse health effects reported from the spraying were discounted by public health officials. Evidence of an institutional dogma that the spray is safe resulted over the years in most adverse spray effects reported by the community being relabeled as simply psychosomatic responses. As Stephanie noted, it was all in our heads. But why was this necessary? Because if the government had to accept there were health effects from the pesticide, then they would be unable to carry on using it. 
They abdicated responsibility for our health in favor of biosecurity interests. And in many cases, these health effects were not minor or transient. Hundreds of people experienced health effects from serious skin and respiratory aggravations due to severe neurological and allergenic conditions. This abdication of responsibility led not only to attempts to influence discredit and downplay unpalatable results of the strain, but overt actions to turn a blind eye. Refusals to carry out studies, blocking of requests and funding for independent health and science research, and sound and valid recommendations ignored, rejected, or regulated away are just some of the mechanisms evidenced. This was why ultimately the community had to step in and conduct its own inquiry into the effects of the two and a half years of spraying against the painted apple mold. You can read all about this groundbreaking First Peoples Inquiry in 2006 on our website. And there are two documentaries that we have listed in our support material that are well worth watching to understand what the community had to endure and the heartbreak that so many people experienced. But without doubt, what came out of this inquiry was that people were not forgotten. And when they came together and supported each other, communities can basically achieve anything. And as Steph mentioned, and we do say it very quietly, that maybe we did get heard because our government has never sprayed another community since. But the final postscript is that I had to pre-record this story for the conference. Because on the same day in Auckland, we had to take our battle to the council once again to try and prevent a return to toxic chemicals on our roads and streets in Auckland. In a marathon session on the same day, councillors at the meeting of the Environment and Climate Change Committee voted unanimously for Chair Richard Hill's recommendations. They rejected a proposed standardisation of weed and vegetation control across the region with basically a roundup mix in favour of harmonising funding. This effectively gives local, local, local decision making back to the local boards, allowing them the budget to choose the methodology they want to use. It is so much more complicated than that, but budgeting and costing anomalies revealed at the meeting means that thermal technologies like hot water, hot foam and steam were just as cost effective as the Roundup mix and capable of being used throughout the entire region. So that we are still having to hold our corner after 30 years of successful non-chemical treatment, that we are still having to do this in the face of all the evidence of harmful effect of these toxic chemicals is, is gut-wrenching. Auckland is also abdicating responsibility for our health. And if nothing else, our new 2020 People's Inquiry will allow this story to be told and the people heard. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, Hannah. Um, that brings us firmly into the present um, and really highlights some of the battles that are still going on. Um, I think it was uh, earlier in the year, the same thing was happening in Christchurch. Uh, Christchurch City Council was trying to um, go back to, you know, glyphosate across the whole city and they were met with the same kind of response that they received in Auckland and they reneged on their decision. So that was a, a positive outcome. Um, but I know this is an ongoing thing. I did want to, at this point, maybe just speak a little bit about glyphosate. Um, for those who are familiar with the Soil and Health Association of New Zealand, they have um, started up a campaign to get glyphosate, expo no public exposures. There's a petition on their website. Um, I think uh, they publish the Organic NZ magazine. So you can go to their Organic NZ magazine website. Um, they also have put out a series of documents um, basically summarising a lot of the research, international research around glyphosate. So I thought I would just read a few pertinent points for you. Um, so it's been detected in rainfall in Canada, the USA and Argentina and groundwater here in New Zealand. 
Um, and you might be surprised to hear that the New Zealand EPA has never conducted a risk assessment of glyphosate. They've just gone with industry research, which is unproven and um, not peer reviewed. So um, when you go to your council and you ask them why they're still using glyphosate in the face of all of the overwhelming evidence um, and research, they refer you to the EPA's decision to say that it's safe. So there's this passing the buck, um, a, a continual, continual theme. Um, there was one interesting, uh, I'll just bring it up here. There's an interesting um, addition in this document, which is a profile on glyphosate from um, a lab in the USA. So I've just brought it up here on my screen. So this is from the Great Plains Laboratory, laboratory in Kansas um, in the US. So recent studies have discovered that glyphosate exposure um, is a cause of many chronic health problems. Um, it can be absorbed directly through the skin by eating foods that have been treated with glyphosate um, or by drinking water that's been contaminated with it. So it's been linked with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, renal tubal carcinoma, pancreatic isolate cell adenoma, and skin tumors. Um, it's been found to disrupt the microbiome of the intestine. Um, and this disruption could cause diseases such as autism, metabolic disorder, diabetes, depression, cardiovascular disease, and autoimmune disease. Um, and also, and if you weren't aware, earlier this year in July, New Zealand honey came back um, you know, New Zealand honey was tested, 20% of the results came back for positive um, residues of glyphosate. So this is of huge concern. It's, it's in the food chain. Um, and part of the issue we have here in New Zealand is that testing is quite prohibitively expensive. It's not easily accessible. Data is not being collected. We're often having to rely on international information. There's a huge data gap when it comes to this. Um, and you might also be surprised to learn that um, in New Zealand, we used to uh, record the amount of the tonnages of chemicals that were released into our environment, um, but that ended in 2010, and we no, no longer do that. So we don't know how much of this is being used. Um, I'll just stop there. Um, let's see. So that's that's what I wanted to add about that. I'll have more to say about um, the glyphosate. Uh, shortly, but at this point, I would like to invite Ursula um, to share um, her thoughts um, and research on the present day situation and what we're dealing with and some of the other um, conservation related issues. So, welcome, Ursula. Sasha, um, and to your everybody, I think. Um, can you hear me? Oh, okay. Uh, can you, hear me? can you hear me now? Yeah. Speak a bit. Okay. Um, so, cure everybody. I think it's worth just following on from um, the, the, you know, Hannah and and um, what other people have have mentioned here about the the use of various herbicides and pesticides in the cities because from an you know from an outsider's perspective, I remember I've only been in New Zealand for seven years. There's very much um, a, a, um, a division between um, the rural and urban communities here. And it's very interesting to see that, you know, in Auckland and, and Christchurch, pesticides and herbicides like the glyphosate have managed to be kept away. And there are rules that are sometimes abided by in terms of keeping the glyphosate away from playgrounds, etc. But but the thing about the rural communities, which I'll talk about now, is really um, how particularly aerial poisoning is ubiquitous. I mean, it, it is literally not too far away from pretty much any uh, community living in any rural area in New Zealand. The only place really that escapes that is the, um, is the South Island's east coast. Um, and even then, it, it's difficult to escape it. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are now in, um, in terms of New Zealand, because obviously that's pretty much all I've got personal experience of <laughs> is the, and that's where my research has been um, focused um, in terms of the, um, 
Let me just start this off. Um, in terms of the um, present day toxic um, situation in New Zealand. Um, and thinking about that overseas experience, it, it's pretty obvious for, for lots of people how there's been an exponential growth of this green sustainable movement there's been an environmental um you know epiphany really in terms of who wants fast food anymore mcdonald's um fast food places overseas uh, you know have been closing down because people don't want that sort of experience with their food anymore they want slow food um they want organic food or at the very least they want to know where their food has been grown or or where it's come from um we want less food miles um, we want increased value and there's definitely an increased awareness of the food safety that's associated with that and also the benefits to us in the nutritional value of that slow food um, that's come alongside things like the public health issues about obesity for instance and, and chronic disease um, but for some reason New Zealand's just not kept up with that movement that paradigm shift that um steph was talking about so one reason for that is because perhaps we didn't experience here in new zealand that industrial era that many uh, european countries experienced um you know those factories that used a lot of chemicals and people were killed and lessons were learned and new laws were put in place to prevent those chemicals from being used in such a a risky way again and, and because we've been mainly an agricultural um, society here in some ways we haven't learned about those industrial chemicals in the same way um, and there's this she'll be all right kind of attitude towards the agricultural chemicals that have been used but isn't it interesting that the pesticide residue testing across the board pretty much has remained the same you know it's, it's like they've stopped the clock um, they haven't been using the methodologies that they've been using in the USA and the UK um, and in particular the the testing for the 1080 poison contaminated samples that they see um, that that's 30 odd years old old it's not it's not fit for purpose they're not testing for the things that they know they would find and that gives them an excuse the authorities to be able to say legitimately there's no 1080 poison contaminating that particular sample um, because they haven't looked for it they haven't found it and remember this has been going on aerial poisoning has been going on for 65 years that's 1080 and more recently um, in Nelson the brodificum and the brodificum that was uh, that is often spread over the islands in and around New Zealand waters so what is the cocktail effect of this poisoning um, nobody knows you know there, there's been some testing on the toxicity the, what we call the LD50 the the lethal dose of some of these poisons on certain species uh, we don't know what the sublethal effects are and we certainly don't know anything about what the mix-up is going to mean um, for multiple poisons in multiple um, sources of the food chain and, and our drinking water it's totally unknown um, and because this data is missing, um, some of some data is available, but it's from multiple sources. So we've got in New Zealand, we've got the, the Cancer Registry database. We've got the New Zealand Poison Centre. Um, we've got um, various other sources of information from the Environmental Protection Authority, from MPI, from DOT themselves. Um, etc etc it goes on there's multiple different sources of information about the contamination of our environment from poisons but there's not one central source of information about the harm that that's doing to us um, and so for that reason that was one of the reasons I, I got involved in the people's inquiry was because um, I'm one of the, a team of people that that keep trying to keep a record um, in my spare time of the poisoning events that happen and we try to encourage people to write them down um, to get some evidence together and now we've got a, um, a table of about 150 
different incidents stretching back decades, um, poisoned, you know, cattle, pets, um, people that have suffered um, poisoning. Um, and mainly they are a result of aerial poisoning, either with 1080 or Bredifacu. And there's no epidemiological studies. They, that means there's no public health studies that have been done. For 65 years, it's pretty incredible to me as, a, as an outsider that nobody in the Ministry of Health, even after that was one of the primary recommendations from the IRMA 2007 review, the, now the EPA, as Hira said, um, they've just dismissed that recommendation over the years again and again and no public health studies have been done so we don't not only do we not know what the public health impact is we don't know what the sublethal effects are um, from small small minute um, impact from the from the from the poisons that are in our drinking water and in the food chain and of course without that evidence we don't know what's happening so the risk assessments are impossible the district health board, public health units that sign off these aerial poisoning operations can legitimately say that they don't know what the risk is and so therefore it must be safe. And so that's what we call plausible deniability. If you don't produce the evidence, then you can, you can say legally that you don't know and, and therefore um, dismiss people's genuine concerns. Um, so yeah it's a pretty it's a pretty depressing picture to be honest um but oh, um i just skipped one there so why does this happen i don't know why that square is in there but um yeah this is the common question that people ask me um you know how have we got here why are we in this mess what 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 has happened here especially people that have moved here from overseas mm -hmm. um and a lot of that is to do with the su successful marketing of the clean green 100 percent pure new zealand it, it's been probably one of the most successful marketing campaigns ever um and people believe it and and that draws people in and that also dismisses um, people's curiosity perhaps they don't want to hear the the realities of of the lack of um, attention to the to the poisoning and in terms of um, people taking back control uh, the issue of ACC the accident compensation scheme means that there's no action that's possible normally there's no litigation that exists in New Zealand and so no group action as such legally can take place and so there's very little um, opportunity for people to seek compensation um, if somebody has been to blame for the poisoning um, it's just it's just dismissed the public health units is an interesting one we've spoken now colleagues and, and I I've spoken to numerous staff, senior staff at various DHBs in New Zealand, and they openly admit that the system is broken. Um, the medical officers of health that um, sign off the, the applications, the so-called risk assessments, which aren't a risk assessment, they're just an application form that's flawed, um, openly admit that they are under pressure from DOP to sign off those applications, which seems incredible that somebody tasked with being a protector of our public health uh, can be effectively bullied perhaps by the department of conservation or osprey or you know the other authorities that are um, pursuing this this poisoning and those authorities um, are responsible for not protecting us from harm. We know that harm is happening because we've got lots of evidence of harm happening. Um, and that is an abuse of power. In a small population, um, certain individuals have multiple conflicts of interest. I was just, today I was looking at um, the Jansoon project um, where the directors there are, have got multiple roles in Predator Free New Zealand, um, in the so-called um, research scion forest research group um, in the next foundation which is where the funding comes from 
and the Lancare research. Um, there's there's mul there's people that are involved in multiple roles, and they're all connected to the aerial poisoning program. So um, it, it's concerning because there's no true transparency about where that funding is coming from um, and how it's being used, and the consultancy fees that you often see in these reports, the annual reports of these companies and so-called charities. Um, what, you know, where, where are those consultants and how much are they being charged? Um, it's, all, it's all very concerning. So it is an abuse of power. And the education versus propaganda, this is something that is close to my heart because as an educationalist, uh, it is very concerning to see that scientific facts are replaced with pro-poison propaganda dangerous, dangerous statement saying that poison is safe, which is a total contradiction. How can a poison be safe? Especially a poison like 1080, which is le highly lethal in even a small dose and has no antidote. Um, so it's, it's the media that are controlling the narrative and they set up unhelpful binaries about pest versus native and maybe even Pākehā versus Māori and you know what's an invasive pest versus all of these kinds of things are just unhelpful and alongside that you've got the actual workplaces where these individuals are based and anybody who perhaps questions that status quo often ends up being uh, the focus of a, t a target a victim of workplace bullying alienation and discrimination just for speaking out um, about that that's happened multiple times so the government agencies and contractors are breaking multiple laws and i have got some examples of those from the case study here in mount Porongia, um, and very rarely are they ever held to account because of the no, there's no litigation and who as a community um, you know can take the government to task it's, it's an incredible it's, a, it's an incredible um, feat and and that's why again the people's inquiry is so important because how else are we going to be heard? These people's voices need to be heard and uh, we, they need a, somebody to, to help facilitate that and, and hopefully the People's Inquiry will be able to do that. So I don't want to um, stay on this too long, but just as an example, as a follow up to what um, Hira and um, Steph has mentioned about the laws. So the thing is, there are laws in place and there are standard operating procedures and guidelines um, that are across the board there to help us and to protect public health, but they're not being um, adhered to. They're not, nobody is, is taking them seriously. And when they are broken, who is taken aside and, and held as accountable? It's just not, it's not happening. And we don't really know why. Um, so a big one here is the Health Act 1956, which is specifically about protecting us from harm and obviously aerial spraying of us and our um, environment and our food chain, contaminating our drinking water catchments, that's not protecting us from harm. And moving on from that, the Health Drinking Water Amendment Act specifically says um, that you shouldn't have a known contaminant in a drinking water. Well, not only are they allowing a known contaminant, but they're allowing a teratogenic poison, which is a poison which potentially um, has a harmful effect on the unborn child. The Māori Land Act, um, there's no valid consultation that happens. That happened here in Mount Prongia, where at least seven or eight of the local Marae um, wrote to the DHBs and to DOC, specifically saying that they had not been consulted fairly and they had not been consulted at all in some in some cases and that they did not consent to the aerial poisoning of their land and, and they were just ignored over and over again they were ignored the wild animal control act uh, prevents you know poison prevents grazing hunting and gathering from our whenua um, again that's you know that's not helpful um, to to the communities to have that taken away and it is breaking the law. The Conservation Act, Section 4, again, stipulates that there should be fair consultation, and there hasn't been. And the Treaty of Waitangi Act, um, there's a big complexity of, of issues there around manipulating people's um, 
agreements in terms of what they should allow in terms of poison on their land. And as Hira said, the HASNO Act, the Hazardous Substances and New Organisms Act, which specifically says in section 6D that they, uh, the authorities should have a meaningful respect for Maori culture. And we know that that's just not happened over and over again. As I've mentioned before, there's, um, there's been no public health studies on this. Um, and we're not just talking about the physical impact of this poison, we're also talking about the mental health and people that we've spoken to down, especially down on the South Island, which is regularly um, suffered. Sometimes some of those communities have aerial poisoning operations around them every six months and there's nothing they can do to stop it. So there's a mental trauma there, uh, the sound of helicopters carrying poison overhead. And it is reminiscent of what um, Steph um, was talking about with Graham Sturgeon about being in a, a war zone. You know, this is potentially um, traumatic enough to, you know, you can't escape it. So it's not just physical health um, from things like the toxic dust, uh, but it is also about the mental health as well. I'm getting towards the end now. So um, I just wanted to point out here some examples from the Department of Conservation's um, pesticide summary. And again, this is about access and equity. Uh, very few people perhaps have even know about this website where uh, you can access the interactive maps from the Department of Conservation that show you where the planned 1080 poison operations are and where they have been. Um, and it's millions of hectares. It's about 2 million hectares uh, that are being poisoned throughout New Zealand. So the land and the drinking water catchments um, consistently being poisoned, uh, so, as I say, sometimes every six months. And we're not just talking 1080, we're talking the combination of lots of these poisons, uh, as we've said before, Brodificum, Pindone, um, sodium monofluoracate 1080 is the most prolific one in terms of aerial spraying. And so um, how can you help? You can help by getting informed. Um, you can spread the word, you can share and raise awareness. Um, have a look at the Department of Conservation's pesticide summaries. Have a look at the Osprey, um, which was TV free website as well. They have a separate site and have a look at your regional local councils and and commercial companies is something that you probably won't know about because they don't have a requirement to tell people what they're up to in terms of their poisoning but you might see it in a local paper or on the notice board on the private land and being aware of those risks is is really important and i think actually now that we've got the covid19 issue with lack of tourism in New Zealand. New Zealanders traveling around their own country sometimes for the first time, I'm pretty sure they'll be shocked, like I was shocked seven years ago, to see the extent of the poisoning and the lack of wildlife, the lack of bird life in those areas that have suffered um, the, the aerial poisoning for many years. So, um, that's that's pretty much where I want to be in terms of the um, the the stuff that I want to share with you. Um, the 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 people's inquiry is something that is really important to um, to raise awareness of people from all over New Zealand um, and what they suffered. Um, and and just some recognition, some respect, and some recognition of what they've been through, and and looking for some solutions, which is what Ash is going to tell us about now. All right, thank you, thank you very much, Ursula. Yeah, it's, it's a lot to take in. Um, had lots of thoughts to share while you were were saying that, but I I think I'll just um. Yep, I'll just focus on what I've got to share next. Now, I don't, don't have all the solutions, but I think that it's important that we have to start thinking about this. Um, so I'm just going to share a little bit here. Okay. 
So just very briefly, what have we learned? We're still heading down the wrong track, clearly, you know, from what Ursula said and the normalization of using all of these different chemicals is just very, very ingrained. Um, conservation biodiversity approaches rely on toxic chemicals. Um, we've got this mindset of a war on nature, a war on weeds, a predator free. It's, it's an eradication mindset. It's an unwinnable war. Um, and our food, our food is poisoned, horticulture, agriculture. Um, I met a couple um, not long ago who recently moved to into the local area um, and they had a potato market garden that um, decided to uh, pop up alongside them. They're using 26 different chemicals to grow these potatoes and there's no barrier between their properties. So this is how much poison's actually going into producing our food. We're just not aware of it. So the future, a pathway forward. What do we need? Honesty, integrity and understanding. We've got these discussions going and, and lots of, we're in a transition phase, climate change, sustainability, carbon sequestration, cutting back on fossil fuels, but entirely absent from this conversation is chemical poisons and agro, agrochemical based agriculture and horticulture. It's, it's absent. We, we hear about nitrates, you know, um, farmers, we, we're on the case of farmers about our nitrates in our waters, but we're not looking at the chemicals they're using. Why is that? It's being purposefully left out of the conversation. That, that's how I feel. So can we have a truly sustainable, healthy, clean, green Aotearoa with the heavy, heavy uh, use of chemical poisons? The short answer is no, we definitely cannot. They're based on fossil fuels. They destroy natural fertility. They erode our immune systems and cause all kinds of disease. They pollute and harm the foundation of life, our whakapapa, our DNA and our future generations. And they're based on cruelty and indifference to our fellow creatures. So if, if we're talking about sustainability and if we're reaching for that goal and, and you know, our government has just um, issued a climate emergency, we cannot be talking about those things without addressing these issues. There's no way forward without addressing the use of chemicals in this country. So we're on the precipice of change. I think this is the paradigm shift that Stephanie was alluding to. Um, there's no question we need to change. The practices are harming us. They're harming all life on the planet. If we're serious about it, we have to start addressing them. But wait, we're still greenwashing. It's kind of like we're right up the tip of the roller coaster. You know, as you climb to the top, the things get more and more extreme. Well, I'm hoping we're about to take the dive over the edge, you know, in the coming years. So the greenwashing is really strong in this country. A lot of people are conditioned um, and these chemicals are normalized. We're still being led down the garden path. Perfect examples. After the uh, lockdown, the government announced $1.1 billion to go to the creation of 11,000 new nature, green, green jobs. But what we're actually not acknowledging is that these green jobs and conservation, the vast majority of them use toxins. So we're putting, we're putting people into green nature jobs, but we're making them use poisons. So there's a real disconnect there. Um, here's another example. So weeding on a giant scale, they took all the tourism workers or, or many tourism workers that were no longer able to work in their industries because of, because of lockdown. Um, and they're out there clearing wilding pines and poisoning, poisoning the stumps. So I think from the perspective of this inquiry that um, it's very alarming, you know, there's a very, very real chance that we're going to see whole new generations of Kiwis being poisoned. Um, another example is the government's offering Kiwis a thousand dollars bonus to, to pick up work in horticulture. Now I live in a horticultural area. Um, it's a kiwi fruit growing area. We have migrant workers that come, or seasonal workers that come every year. I know for a fact that they go home. Um, you know, they, they, they go home with health problems. They, they're often in the health shop here. They're being led into the orchards before the withholding period of these substances and come up with lesions all over their arms. And this is a regular occurrence. So now this is, we're, we're swapping out those workers for kiwi workers. So I'm feeling that, if things don't change, there's going to be a lot more exposure happening to, to a lot of young, vulnerable young people who are looking for, genuinely looking for work. So this is a huge time of upheaval and change and with it comes the opportunity out of crisis. As you, as you know, we're, we're in transition. Many things are changing at the moment and shifting. Our government's putting millions of dollars into these green jobs. 
So we need to make sure that in fact they're not toxic jobs, that they are truly green jobs because that is actually what we need to heal the planet and to deal with many of our issues. So I think it's upon us to be aware that when they say they're creating these jobs, you know, we have to consider the current paradigm that we're living in and the situation that these people are going to be put in. So I would like to add an emphasis on the importance of creating and supporting new ways of being um, and doing that uphold truly holistic approaches. We can no longer tolerate the greenwashing. So where do we begin? Well, as, um, as uh, part of Flora and Fauna of Aotearoa, a founder um, of this small group um, that seeks to kind of help to, help to stimulate and find some of the solutions, um, we're connected with um, the Soil and Health Association and the Non-Toxic Neighbourhoods um, group. So one of the things that we're working on is getting people to get on the spray-free register in their local area. Um, I'll just... Yep, so, so a starting point, a starting point, individuals, your own verge, you know, um, then your neighbourhood and your communities getting together with people. Um, and by simply putting out signs like this and getting on the spray-free register, I think we start to get at, we start to actually, um, yeah, good job, Steph. We start to, we start to plant seeds, start to plant ideas and start to, erode away that normal that normalness that is built up you know around the use of these poisons the she'll be right mate i'll go out and spray in my jandals and my shorts you know um there's a lot of beekeepers around where i live so i know this will be well received especially since glyphosate's been found in honey recently so it's about networking with your community and and building that now the non-toxic neighborhoods is a great example um and this is you know obviously referring to you know roadside sprays um, they have an excellent website, they're an American initiative, um, but they have made all of their resources available and they have uh, a very well thought out um, approach, which is basically educate and activate. They, they try to build relationships with their city, city planners, their, the local landscape contractors. So it's about building relationships and education because once people actually start to hear and understand the effects of of glyphosate for example they you know they start to switch how they're thinking and, and often it will activate them into you know um to actually if they're, if they're caring about their health which we we all are now you know particularly in this heightened sense you know with with covid and the plant the pandemic um so i think it's it's triggering that in people and, and helping them to get a sense of of of, of actually genuinely caring for their health um, and their immune system. So agriculture, horticulture, conservation. I'll just skip over this because Ursula mentioned um, about many of those acts. We are protected. We actually are protected. The problem is, is that, that the, the, um, the legislation is not being followed. The plans aren't being followed. So I think there's an opportunity at this time when we're, when we're talking about sustainability and we're talking about climate change and stepping into that space, that new space, um, that we have, to, we have to deal with some of these issues. So it's, it's about um, getting in touch with your, your local bodies, your community boards, um, and really presenting them you know, with, with that information, quality information. Um, so the quagmire of conflicts of interests and cover-ups, it's, it's really challenging, but it needs to be met by highly organized informed citizens. Um, and we need to be demanding accountability and adherence to the law. Um, and those with conflicts of interest, I believe need to be publicly outed. There are so many, it would, it would blow your mind to actually see how, how many conflicts of interest there are that just get ignored. You know, they're not even recognized um, and, and that is something that really needs to shift in this country. We like to think that we're, that we've, we're lowest on the corruption index. Well, it's very far from the truth. Um, and that's another, it's another form of greenwashing, you know, it's whitewashing. Um, so the future, positives. Regenerative agriculture is getting a lot more support, which is wonderful. Organic, the organic sector needs support. They, they've been, they've been, you know, they've had the hand for a long time, but they, they actually need to be brought into the fold and we need to be supporting organic growers as much as we can. 
um, and raising levels of awareness about our health and environment, people are actually just starting to understand and learn this stuff themselves. Um, organisations, community groups and individuals taking affirmative action and positive action, I think is the key. You know, we, the many people in this space have been battling for a long time and coming up against that brick wall, coming up against that brick wall. Well, I think now is the time to, to actually start to, although we might not think that it's our job, but we need to present solutions. We need to just start creating solutions and, and, and then in, inviting councils to like jump on our, jump on our walker. Um, you know, and if it's good enough and it's, and, and it's got the right message and we, you know, we can justify it, then, you know, they have no reason to. Um, so we want green jobs, not toxic jobs. Um, and I think activating each other and supporting each other um, in, and bringing holistic thinking. You know, this is all around holistic thinking. We can, we can no longer afford to have this reductionist perspective where we ignore the true implications of our actions. Um, so I'd like to leave it there and I'd just like to um, invite um, our panel for any last comments on perhaps the future and positives before we uh, take a few questions if there are any. <laughs> Sorry, I ran through that quickly. Um, Steph. Briefly, I've always loved the, the nuclear free zone campaign, which was a truly grassroots campaign and um, was successful. It, it built from the ground up. And so, you know, I think these signs or similar signs all over the country, just popping up on mailboxes and uh, street corners, um, it's like a, a meme, you know, it can go viral and, and it can help maybe change the mentality. That's just one point, um, poison-free zones to make it um, a nationwide um, generic poison-free zone campaign. The other point, and you raised it, Asha, um, with this recent climate change emergency declaration and, uh, you know, the whole poison industry is based on fossil fuels from manufacturing through to transport through to distribution. And I haven't done the maths, you know, if there's some maths geek out there, who could do the calculations of the actual fossil fuel consumption that, that underpins this poison industrial complex. Um, so that, that has to be um, emphasised more now that we've, we're in a climate change emergency. Okay, we, we move away from synthetic poisons. So that's just another, I mean, there's been so many, um, so much evidence and so many um, angles on this presented tonight. Um, it's, it's, it's the activation of, of the population now and um, sharing these, you know, supporting the positive ways forward. And I, I, think, I think we are on the edge of a huge change. And I, I you know, I, I do keep my faith. I do um, stay hopeful for some bizarre, irrational reason. I remain hopeful <laughs> that, um, you know, 2021 will be a shift. And if we, with the People's Inquiry, we hold our hearings in maybe March, April, and, and you know, we assemble all these threads in one big basket, one big kete of evidence, it, it might help um, push that, that change. So there's my little, little word. <laughs> <laughs>